The name Amstrad means different things to different people. For some, it means this. Good grief. Others, this. In London, England. It's what we rather hope you guys might come up with. But for most of us, it invariably means this. The Amstrad 464 is the 64K home computer with a monitor and data recorder included. The Amstrad CPC is an iconic computer from the mid-1980s. Released in 1984, it was somewhat of a latecomer to the flooded British 8-bit micro scene, but despite the odds, managed to become the third biggest selling 8-bit home computer in the UK, and dominated in other parts of Europe. It's often seen as an auto-ran to the Commodore 64 and Sinclair Spectrum, but once you delve into the story, you begin to see that actually it was anything but. Alan Michael Sugar was born in 1947 and spent his early years in a Northworld estate, cramped into a room with his siblings and bearing witness to a rather modest upbringing in East London. Although his mother recounted times when Alan's future bashful character came through, he was reportedly a reserved child, but clearly took a lot on board. In his teenage years, it didn't take long for him to seek a more prosperous life for himself. Working at the electrical wholesaler R. Henson Limited in Finchley, his job was to take electrical samples to retailers and strike a deal. This quickly enabled Sugar to develop a large knowledge of retail outlets and products in the capital, but the Henson's management left a sour taste in his mouth. Despite instigating some lucrative ideas for the business, Henson's never seemed particularly grateful for Sugar's work. One of Sugar's rounds involved collecting goods from Benetton's owner, Gulu Lavani, and it didn't take long for him to realise he could go solo and make more money for himself than working for Henson's. Thanks to the friendship he established with Lavani, he slightly struck up a deal in 1966 with Benetton and handed over a seven-day post-dated cheque for a van of goods. He then promptly sold these goods the same day and returned to pay off Lavini with cash the very same night. At the age of 19 and armed with an unreliable minivan costing just £80, this was the beginnings of Amstrad. Sugar initially kept his stock in a shed in the backyard of the Redbridge-based house he had bought with his recent wife, Anne Simmons. However, after £1,500 of merchandise was stolen, he began to rent a premises in St John Street, a base for many a small business and workshop, and in November 1968, registered as a limited business under the name of AMS Trading General Importers. The AMS representing Alan Michael Sugar. At this stage, the business was very much a buying and selling operation. However, it didn't take Sugar long to realise that putting his name on these wholesale products would not only gain credibility, but also create an image among his buyers. This brand name, more out of luck from the original company name than anything else, would be Amstrad, an amalgamation of AMS and trading, creating an immediately flowing and memorable name. The first products to possess this brand were imported cigarette lighters and room-to-room -room intercoms, and the branding involved a simple stick-on badge. 1968 would also be the year which another entrepreneur, Clive Sinclair, was causing a stir in the audio hobbyist community by placing four-page colour adverts for small audio amplifiers, and it didn't take long for Sugar to cotton on to this new and exciting electronic market. Over the next few years, Sugar built up an astute knowledge of the cheapest suppliers and the best places to sell them, whilst also himself delving into electrical repair on shipments of faulty goods, gaining extra income and boosting his own knowledge of the trade. One of them who took this rather seriously was Alan Sugar, who was just starting up at that time. He made the wooden boxes, bought the electronics from us and sold them as, as hi-fi systems and that's really how he got started actually by buying Sinclair amplifiers and putting in boxes. And it didn't take long for him to open up his own retail business on the side. Along with his friend Ashley Morris, the pair opened Global Audio, a shop that would sell audio equipment much like the ones Sugar was already selling too. But Sugar was a man with many fingers in many pies, and although this side operation was successful, he sold his share to Morris so he could concentrate on launching the first in-house developed Anstrad product. 
In a strategy that would become his main playing card, Sugar had noticed that people were spending a lot of money on dust covers for turntables and identified a way to reduce costs. This was by moving to injection moulding rather than vacuum forming, and soon shifted to the cheaper alternatives using the contacts he'd established from the beginning. Like Sinclair, this move into audio would follow with a range of amplifiers and other components for hi-fi, although with a more value-orientated approach than the technical innovation Sinclair was offering. Sugar wasn't the kind to sit in one place for long, and armed with his brash cockney attitude, which usually went completely at odds with other people in the industry, Amstrad soon launched their first consumer electrical product in the form of the Amstrad 8000 stereo amplifier, pushing sales to over £200,000 and allowing the business to move into a small set of warehouses on Fleet Street. This was in 1970, and Sugar would later go on to term the 8000 the biggest load of rubbish I've ever seen in my life. And a number of improved versions evolved, but each bearing the same advantage of completely undercutting the cost of the competition. Sugar was making products for what he would term the truck driver and his wife. By 1972, Amstrad's sales had almost doubled, allowing another move to yet bigger premises on Ridley Road, operating as a large-scale British manufacturer. But Sugar realised he could make further savings by sourcing components directly from manufacturers in Japan, rather than using an electronics importer as they had been before. Several eastern-bound trips allowed Sugar to grasp the potential of OEM, Original Equipment Manufacturing, where products are fully assembled abroad to requirements and simply badged with the Amstrad name. This led to several new Amstrad products, which involved Amstrad doing very little other than paying for the equipment and shipping them to retailers, much like the early days. This new subcontracting operation later formed an alliance with a British subcontractor, L&N, allowing Sugar more control over the presentation of his products, something he was quite concerned with, much more so than the actual technical manufacture, which was often echoed in magazine reviews. By 1980, the company had bought premises in Tottenham for £300,000. Sales were up to £8.76 million, and Sugar had got himself a Rolls, acquired a pilot's licence, snapped up some 30% of the car radio market through imports, and established a solid reputation. Companies found him easy to deal with, being straightforward and essentially acting as the chairman, sales director, financial chief, technical guru, and everything else, all rolled into one representative. Although expansion had enabled him to take on a larger management team to cope with the increased pressure. Amstrad's technology also looked good and had become reliable. The only two things which Sugar essentially cared about in a product. The company had also gone public, providing some £2 million investment and widening the opportunities available. But it was his next card trick which really solidified things further. <laughs> Towers, belt drive, three band tuner, tuner. tuner. continuous play, play, midis. Over in Japan, audio companies had begun to group separate hi fi elements into one package. However, Sugar would take this idea, improve it, simplify it, and lower the cost. All of these things would emerge by combining all the separate elements into one single unit, made to look like separate pieces. Something that we've taken for granted ever since, really. Sugar's attention to aesthetics ensured the units looked expensive, with an array of flashing lights, fake switches, and anything else that would match it to more expensive separate units. An image that Sugar would term a mug's eyeful. The towers were beautifully simple compared to existing hi fis Simply plug it in and you were away, instead of the usual collection of wires spooling out of the back. Do you want an amp? Uh, no, I want <laughs> You won't hear anything, Grandad, without an amp, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Of course, yes, I want an amp. <laughs> Woolworths snapped up the TS40 Tower hi fi, along with Rumbelows, Curries, and Amstrad's existing stockist, Comet. It would be the first product to sell in hundreds of thousands. Priced at £199, this left some £130 for Amstrad, a hefty margin and a great source of revenue. The hi-fi buffs weren't enamoured by the kit, but like all of Amstrad's products, this wasn't made for them. Sound, it's a it's a 
Legalisation of CB radio in the UK allowed Amstrad further success, poised and ready to pounce as they were, along with the lines of other electronics including televisions, both imported and manufactured in-house, as well as video recorders and various other electronics. But Amstrad wasn't a company to sit in the marketplace for long, with Sugar only interested in profit margins. If he felt that a line was in danger from competition or natural market decline, it would be cut without hesitation. With Japanese competition mounting, Amstrad quickly decided to temporarily exit both the VCR and TV markets in 1984. But after all, a new line of electronics had caught their eye. The personal computer. To be fair, Amstrad were already making waves in this arena. They had just released several high-speed tape-to-tape recording machines with the advertising, you can make a copy of your favourite cassette. Something which would stir the music industry into a frenzy, resulting in various court cases against Amstrad, with Amstrad finally prevailing, but also allowed users of the emerging tape-based home computers to quietly copy their tapes and perhaps pass them on to friends, instigating the dark, dark world of pirate games. Each pirate video you buy could contribute to your child shooting up in the school lavatory. You know what that is, don't you? Yeah, but not so much. By now, Amstrad's turnover was some £85 million, with profits of almost £10 million, resulting in Alan Sugar receiving Guardian Young Businessman of the Year. At the end of 1983, he announced, The new products to be unveiled in the coming year will be in true Amstrad fashion. One step ahead of the market, and most definitely, the competition. By now, the UK home micro scene was in full swing. Starting with the Sinclair Z80 at the turn of the decade, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum had now been selling in steady numbers for just over a year. The BBC Micro for two years, and 1983 had seen the emergence of the American Commodore 64 strolling onto our shores. But the arrival of the home micro hadn't gone amiss from Amstrad. It's just that Sugar had to wait until the market was just about right for Amstrad to do their usual tricks. Back in 1982, Sugar had realised that the home micro market was big. Far bigger than what they were making in Hi-Fi, and at the time big enough to hold companies like Sinclair, Acorn, Commodore, Oric, Dragon and a slew of other businesses all competing for business. Engineer Ivor Spissel, who would go on to be Sugar's longest serving employee, suggested offering an all-in-one device that would be affordable as an impulse purchase. Sugar and Bob Watkins, Amstrad's technical director, had initially asked a couple of engineers, who had previously worked with Amstrad, to take on the task. However, by mid-1983, underestimating the work needed to produce a computer, they had concluded that this duo was struggling somewhat. This suspicion was compounded when the software designer disappeared and the hardware designs were demonstrated as seriously behind schedule. In this time, the outer casing for the machine had already been completed. Sugar's headstrong image for the machine had taken precedent, meaning that the final motherboard and technical components would have to be designed to accommodate the space allocated. So, armed with this case, Bob Watkins had taken a stroll down to see Roland Perry at Ambit International, another company who had worked for Amstrad in the past, whose main business was running an electrical component mail order catalogue, which allowed funding for side products such as calculators and other electronic kits. His question to Roland was whether they could finish what had already been started. A tall order. But after speaking to his MD, William Powell, the pair decided it was an opportunity they could not turn down. Amstrad wanted a system fast, within five months fast, so Powell and Perry's task was to oversee the project and recruit the staff they needed to get the job done. Their first meeting with the original designers apparently yielded that most of the work had so far been completed by the hardware designer's 14-year-old son, and could only currently display a few characters on screen. Impressive for a 14-year-old, less impressive in the eyes of Amstrad. Perry quickly sought a new team of engineers from the technology centre of what then seemed the world, Cambridge, and set about finding the hardware whilst acquiring a suitable operating system and basic interpreter. Microsoft Basic, the most common go-to, was expensive to license, so Sugar decided it would be more cost-effective to write their own interpreter. Richard Clayton was apparently the man to turn to this, operating locomotive software from his back room, and although highly impressed by the already completed outer casing, was a little miffed by the state of the hardware. 
The current system was using a 6502 processor at its core, and given Locomotive's lack of familiarity with this chip, Clayton estimated it would take some 8 months to get an OS and interpreter up and running. He suggested calling up his friend Mark Eric Jones, working under the name of MEJ Electronics. Their suggestion was to scrap the current design and build something around the Z80 processor. Clayton's exposure to this chip meant he could adapt some work he'd recently completed for Acorn in a much shorter time frame, and MEJ knew the electronics inside out. It was also around this time, under a shroud of secrecy, that the Amstrad prototype gained the nickname Arnold. Perry had given the system a temporary badge to hide the backer behind this project, and most people assumed it was with General Electric Company, run by Lord Arnold Weinstock. It wasn't until later, reportedly, that Roland Perry realised that Arnold was in fact an anagram of his own name. The secrecy, however, didn't last long, as MEJ and Locomotive were called to a meeting with Alan Sugar to finalise terms and plan out a timescale. Chris Hall was the only member of Locomotive to own a suit, and so attended, along with MEJ, William Powell and Bob Watkins. The engineers had assumed that Bob Watkins was in charge. That is, until Sugar arrived late no. and everyone fell silent. Sugar, in his boisterous fashion, then laid out his vision. Whilst other manufacturers were fiddling around with what Sugar described as pregnant calculators, the new Amstrad machine would have perceived value for money. Just like the Hi-Fi's, having a Mux Eiffel was central to the mix. The pre-designed CPC case with its wide footprint, bold coloured keys, grilled edges and high-tech finish were designed to do just that. A machine that looked like a real computer you see in airports or offices was his core vision. Something that the lorry driver and his wife could look at and think, now that looks the deal. Incorporating a tape deck straight from their hi-fis into the machine and bundling a monitor was also core to this premise. Not only did this make the machine look the part, but it turned the whole package into something incredibly simple to plug in and use. Just like the all-in-one hi-fi, there would only be two wires connecting the keyboard to the monitor and a single plug, with a PSU for both units built into the monitor itself. Sugar had dabbled with the existing micros and found them utterly aggravating and unhelpful to set up. His ability to see things as the average working Joe allowed foresight that just wouldn't register with the likes of Sinclair or Acorn computers. The bundled monitor would also eliminate the problem of a family TV set being unusable during the computer's operation, meaning it was likely to be used more and for longer periods of time. All the engineers needed to do was make it work. The specifications Amstrad provided were pretty basic, with the only insistences really being to have colour, sound and 64k of memory to match it to the highest capacity found among competition, and to do it as cheaply as humanly possible. Here then was a team given a few months to design the basis for a complete computer system, something that would usually take five times the personnel and five times the time but the engineers were actually pretty excited about the challenge and set to work immediately. One of their early strokes of genius was to use a ULA chip to combine the multiple functions and reduce cost, much like the Sinclair machines. In fact, the final CPC technical specs were not too dissimilar from that of Clive's little machine, and although price was key, it even had a number of improvements. As well as being able to display up to 16 colours from a palette of 27, there were two other resolution modes allowing a CGA style 4 colours at 320 by 200 pixels and two colours at 640 by 200, all without the colour clash attribute found in Clive's machine. The system also supported basic 4 pixel hardware scrolling, which was really a credit to the team's design and pride in their work. The Z80 CPU ran at roughly 3.3 MHz to prevent interference with the shared video circuit memory, whilst the memory could effectively be upgraded to 512 KB through bank switching. Sound emits from an onboard speaker and is driven by General Instruments AY38912 sound chip, providing 3 channels and 7 octaves. A vast improvement over the Speckies onboard beeper, and much more similar to what the Spectrum 128 Plus would accrue some 2 years later. Given the bundled 14-inch monitor, there was no need for an RF output, with a display driven from an RGB connector resulting in what would appear a much clearer display than most systems of the time. 
but there was a DB9 port for a joystick allowing two for a splitter cable, an expansion bus, printer bus, power switch internal speaker volume dial and a stereo output jack. Sugar wanted what was at its heart a games machine. He understood this is where the money lay, but the machine needed business appeal and the team had certainly delivered the goods there on both fronts. With Bob Watkins happy with the design, Locomotive got the OS and basic interpreter up and running in an incredibly narrow space of time, taking on more staff as they went. The initial prototypes were ready by November 1983 and presented to Alan Sugar. The first thing that Sugar requested was that the cursor be movable at all times using the directional arrows. Most interpreters at the time didn't allow this, but in typical Sugar style he wanted the machine to respond immediately to the average chap in the shops jabbing the arrow keys, providing a reassuring response regardless of its advantages. The hastily built prototypes were then shipped immediately to software developers around the country along with some Amstrad televisions to serve as monitors. An operation was then put into motion to convince these software houses to write some programs for the system in time for its launch. If a deal couldn't be struck with a particular house, then someone would pick up the machine and take it to another software house, until there were 50 machines in the hands of 50 developers, ready to create launch titles for the CPC. have memories. Amstrad knew that the software lineup was key for any machine's success. They had witnessed Sinclair's market success and the demise of other machines, which just lacked a suitable array of games, and with Amstrad's business knowledge they were quick to identify this. It's for this reason that several Ambit employees, including Perry and Powell, were brought on board under the name of Amsoft and put to task creating their own line of software for the machine, along with setting up a users club to duplicate the same kind of support the Spectrum and Commodore 64 had naturally evolved. The current CPC prototypes didn't yet have the ULA chips on board, instead they were simulated using an array of separate chips and discrete components, which was handy because the ULA was initially riddled with problems. Ferranti, the company tasked with creating these chips just couldn't create something that worked, so Sugar decided to get another company, SGS based in Italy, to have a go as well, keen to ensure that the machines were launched as soon as humanly possible. At the same time, Sugar got onto Ferranti and shouted the phone off to them. You're fine. And both companies soon enough created working chips and the new components were quickly shipped out to Orion for manufacture in Japan. It was Orion themselves who had vast experience in display manufacturing, who then suggested using the high contrast yellow on blue colour scheme to ensure maximum clarity. With the changes made, the OS was completed in its final guise and shipped to Orion in the third week of January 1984 to be laid into silicon for the final design. It was only when the firmware was mid-flight that Richard Clayton discovered a minor bug in one of the basic operations. The DEC dollar function required two opening brackets rather than one. But, given that its only use was to return a decimal string representation of a supplied variable, it was non-essential to operation, and Sugar, keen to be as professional with the Japanese as they were with Amstrad, decided to just remove it from the manual rather than request Orion to change it. This was more of an egotistical point with Sugar, who was always keen to out-Japanese the Japanese. Apart from this tiny hiccup, Roland Perry and Amstrad hit a winner with MEJ and Locomotive Software. Not only was a decent machine operating system and interpreter delivered within time, it also didn't cause Sugar much concern in the financials department. Like a lot of people, neither MEJ or Locomotive were convinced Amstrad would succeed in a saturated market, and so during negotiations, rather than opting for royalty payments on machines sold, both companies opted for a fixed lump sum. As Locomotive wanted to retain the intellectual property rights, this was £45,000 for the first two years and £15,000 per year afterwards. Amstrad had no problems agreeing to those terms, and the machine was poised and ready to go. The Amstrad CPC-464 was unveiled in April 1984, just eight months since Bob Watkins had walked into Ambit's offices. 
The opening ceremony was orchestrated by Michael Joy's consultants to various members of the press, hiring the hall at Westminster School and managing to track down people with the names of Archimedes, Einstein, Monet and Shakespeare to demonstrate respective aspects of the machine. The press were impressed by it, and it was quickly dubbed the People's Computer, exactly as Alan Sugar had intended. At £229 with a green monochrome monitor, £329 for colour, it was incredibly well priced, equaling if not exceeding Commodore 64 specifications and including a monitor. Users who purchased the green screen would be able to upgrade to colour through the purchase of an MP1 or MP2 device, incorporating the modulator and power pack needed to hook the machines up to a standard television. Whilst over in Japan, Amstrad had also located a stockpile of 3 inch disk drive components going cheap. The 3.5 inch format was beginning to take over, so rather than going to waste just before launch, Sugar asked his engineers to create an external disk drive for the CPC to help push the business aspect of the technology. This was quickly done, conforming to the Hitachi and Panasonic standard, and a swift deal was tied up with digital research to port the CPM operating system to the CPC like the 3 inch discs and OS that was losing its battle to MS-DOS. Amstrad agreed to pay for a large number of licenses up front, demonstrating how firm Sugar was in his belief that the CPC would make inroads. To this end, there was also a package including the disc drive for £429, meaning the system could fall straight onto the desks of business as well as the kitchen table. Given the sturdiness of the 3 inch discs, they would likely survive just fine in the kitchen as well. Guy Cooney of Personal Computer World wrote, The Amstrad is a powerful, fast machine with plenty of memory, easy to program and packaged in a way that means it will comfortably outsell the Acorn Electron and give the Commodore 64 and Sinclair Spectrum a hard run for their money. I expect some 200,000 systems to be sold by the end of the year. It's not hard to see why. From the moment you set up the CPC, it's blissfully straightforward. You can plonk the monitor down using the built-in handle, connect the two cables into the CPC itself, which extrude from the front so you don't have to scrabble around at the back, and you're good to go. Even after turning the machine on, everything just feels right. The image is crystal clear thanks to the RGB connection. The keyboard feels responsive, including the arrow keys, allowing you to chuck the cursor wherever you feel, and also handy touches like the copy key leap out. There's no need to mess around with a cassette deck, along with all the wires and making sure the volume level is correct. Everything just feels like it's going to work and keep working. Whereas using a Spectrum can feel like an experimental laboratory test at times. There's always a slight fear that something will suddenly stop working. This fear itself is something Amsoft played up to when Acorn attacked Sinclair's machine failure rate by announcing a game called This Business Is War, featuring characters that looked incredibly similar to Clive Sinclair and Chris Curry of Acorn, but apparently the source code was lost and the game never surfaced. Are you sure? You want to go with the one knocking Sinclair? Just run it. The modest hour queue which formed when the CPC first went on sale may seem insignificant by today's standards, but back then it was anything but. 60 people waited for an hour for the Rumbelow store in London's Edgware Square to open on Thursday the 21st of June 1984. Wake Me Up Before You Go Go by Wham was riding the UK charts and the Amstrad CPCs were certainly go going. Within an hour, 100 CPCs had been sold. Soon, machines were available in many high street stores thanks to Amstrad's existing connections. Dixon's unbeatable Christmas deals. To further lure the crowds, Amsoft and other willing developers had created enough titles for the initial bundle to ship with a whopping 12 titles, claimed by Amstrad to be worth over £100. This included Roland in the Caves and Roland on the Ropes, named after Roland Perry himself. Other games included O Mummy, Harrier Attack, and Sultan's Maze, along with productivity applications like Easy Am's Word. This really was the complete package, and thanks in part to its industrial look, it radiated a feel of quality and professionalism, which was something lacking in the market. 
The all-in-one solution also lowered returns. Many of Sinclair's products were returned because people just couldn't work out how to tune them in or work them, whereas the CPC was as simple as moving a fruit bowl aside, parking on the table and flicking a switch. However, only caring about numbers, the city wasn't privy to all this reasoning and was still sceptical of another new machine entering the already flooded market. Sinclair had by now sold over 1 million ZX Spectrums, and excess Acorn Electron stock was waiting in warehouses, having missed the 1983 Christmas rush due to production problems. Something you'll note almost every other micro-manufacturer endured in the early 80s, apart from Amstrad that is. Bill Powell was even quoted as saying, I will be prepared to eat one in Trafalgar Square if it's late. Amstrad shares endured a rocky patch in the year following the CPC's unveiling, with some starting to realise that Christmas 1983 had been the peak for microcomputer sales. Now it was reckoned, Every child who wanted one, had one. But this was Sugar's strength. Identifying an unfulfilled area of the market whilst creating something simpler, better whilst using economies of scale and outsourced manufacturing to make it cheaper. Ultimately, his strength was having conviction in common sense. We are businessmen. We're not uh, made up by a, a team of ex-graduates who are throwing a few electronic components in a plastic box. Thank you for watching part one of the Amstrad CPC story. Depending on how long has passed, you'll either see part two to the left or an alternative video. Feel free to click something, contribute to support me, or just give it a big old thumb in the vertical direction. In any case, have a good evening.